You know, somebody asked me this week what these X's represent, and I didn't have a good answer, so I made one up. But this is what I told them, and this is kind of what I see when I look at this graphic. I look at these X's, and these X's kind of represent something for me. Each one of these X's represent a moment in my life where I saw God move. And when you look at those X's, I mean, think about the moment that you gave your life to Christ. Think about the moment you saw a miracle happen in your life. Think about that moment you saw restoration happen in your family. Think about that moment where God did something good. Think about that moment where well, you had a chain and that chain was broken. Think about that time you experienced freedom for the very first time. See, I believe we all have that one thing in common and that's really what this is all about. It's saying that we can all look back in our past and we can identify moments in time. We can identify things in our life when God just did something good, something God-sized. All of us have that in the past. But I believe what this series is all about and what this new beginning is all about for us is saying, yes, God has done great things in the past. But man, we want to see him do it again. We want to see God move again. We want to see God save again. We want to see God break us again. We want to see God redeem and restore again. And we're not only asking God for it, we're believing God for it. Like we want to experience something bigger than ourselves. We want to see God do the supernatural once again. I don't know about you, but I can identify a lot of times in my life, every single one of those X's are great. But man, I want to see God do it again. Anybody else just say amen. amen. You want to see God move again. If God is going to do it again, we've got to be maximized in the present. We've got to be praying and preparing for what God is going to do in the future. But you know what else we have to do? You and I have to be prepared to battle against evil. And that's what we're talking about this morning. If we're going to see God do something special, something supernatural in the days to come, you and I have to begin right now getting prepared for war. And we've got to get prepared to battle evil because here's a newsflash for you. Ready? Evil is all around us. The devil hates you. He hates your guts. He hates your marriage. He hates your family. He hates us. He hates what's happening in this place today. And that's why the Bible warns us and tells us if we're going to win this race, if we're going to see God do something special again, if we're going to experience victory in this life, then we have to be prepared to battle the evil one because he's coming for us and he hates us. And so that's what we're talking about this morning. If you have a copy of God's word, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 6. And so go ahead and open to Ephesians chapter 6 if you would. And I'm going to explain what the format's going to be like for the teaching this morning. In Ephesians chapter 6, we're going to start at verse 10 and we're going to go all the way to verse 20. And here's what it's going to look like. I'm going to read a little bit, and then we're going to talk a little bit, all right? Read a little bit more, talk a little bit more. And as soon as we get to the passage of Scripture, then we're going to talk about what that looks like for us. And so follow along this morning. I'm going to give you a heads up. I'm going to be moving pretty quick this morning. And so listen, listen closely, listen attentively, and also I encourage you to take notes this morning. Jot some things down that the Lord impresses upon your heart and take them home and think about them before you lay your head on the pillow tonight. Ephesians chapter 6. Now as you're turning there, let me tell you something about the book of Ephesians. Paul wrote the book of Ephesians. He wrote this book, and many scholars believe he wrote it around the year A.D. 60 while serving a two-year prison sentence in Rome. He wrote this letter to several churches, but he was primarily focused on one single church, and that's the church located in the city of Ephesus. Now, I want you to see Ephesus on the map so you'll understand the significance of this city. You'll see right here, in the first century, it was one of the most important cities in the entire world. It was important because it was a major port city. A lot of business went through Ephesus. In fact, it's kind of like the Atlanta of, of today, right? Everything goes through Atlanta. Everything goes through Ephesus. And so it was the most important city in the western part of Asia Minor. It's modern-day Turkey, for those of you who are familiar with that part of the world. And so Ephesus, it was important for a, a, a couple of reasons. Number one, because it was the hub for business and ships would come in and ships would leave. It was the trade route. All of it went through Ephesus. But the second reason it was real important is because Ephesus was also the hub for pagan worship. People would travel from all across the world to go to Ephesus so they would have a chance to worship uh, the, uh, worship at uh, the Roman goddess Diana. Now, the Greeks called this the Temple of Artemis, and I brought a picture so you could see what it looks like. But it was at this temple, people would come to worship Diana, and they would do all kinds of craziness in this, in this location. They would make sacrifices. There were temple prostitutes. People were paying their respects. People would stay there literally weeks and weeks worshiping the goddess Diana, and they would come from 
near and far just to worship in this location. Now that building, it was built around the year 550 BC. And still today, it's considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. So Ephesus was a city where people would come for business. It was also a city where people would come to worship false gods. And here's what I want you to understand about that. Paul knew both of those things. He understand, he understood what Ephesus was all about. He understood how sinful and pagan this city was. He understood that there were masses of people coming for all kinds of reasons. He understood the context. And I believe it's one of the main reasons Paul chose to make this the main center for ministry and evangelism for over three years of his life. He wanted to spend time there because he knew that if God could reach Ephesus, something special could happen. And and now as we read this text, I want you to get that image in your mind. Paul is imprisoned in Rome and he's writing to first century Christians and he's saying the same thing. He's saying, I get the context. I know the sinful world that you're living in. I understand why people are in this city, but I want you to believe that God can still do something here. God can still move. He can do it again. And so that's the context as we begin reading this morning. He's saying God can do something special here, but believers, we've got to be prepared. We've got to be prepared. Verse 10, here we go. Finally, he says, be strengthened by the Lord and by his vast strength. Now, I want you to stop there for just a second. I don't want us just to fly through what Paul just said because I believe it's pretty important. He just said, be strengthened by the Lord and by his vast strength. What is he saying there? Let me tell you. He's saying your natural strength isn't enough to battle the devil. And I think we need to listen to that today. Paul says your natural strength isn't enough. There's some boys in here that say, I'm I'm, I'm tougher than the devil. I'm, I'm smarter than the devil. He can't take me. Yes, he can. He's bigger than you. He's stronger than you. He's more capable than you. He has more gifts than you. The devil is big and the devil is bad. And the thing is, Paul says, you don't have what it takes in and of yourself to defeat the devil. But he goes on to say, but when your strength comes from God's strength, when your power comes from God's power, you have everything you need to overcome. So right off the bat, he says, don't depend on what you already have naturally. Depend on what God has and let his strength be your strength. Verse 11 says, put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. Right there, he's telling us something that we already know. And that is the devil is a schemer. He's scheming against me. He's scheming against you. But he goes on to say, if you're going to stand a chance against him, you have to put on, see those words? Put on the full armor of God of God. Now, what does that mean? It means that you will never wear the protective gear that God offers, and you will never have the armor of God on yourself until you choose to put it on. He says you have to put on the full armor of God, which means the protection of God against the devil in your life isn't just natural. It just doesn't happen. No, you have to choose to put on the full armor of God. Why is that important? Let's keep going. Verse 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. You know, sometimes I I think we forget who the real enemy is. We're like, you know who the enemy is? He is the enemy. She is the enemy. My boss is the enemy. The government is the enemy, right? I mean, it's like we have all of these different enemies and we forget who the real enemy is. See, the enemies that we do battle against consist of many different faces. But what Paul is reminding us of in this passage is this. Those faces are actually just masks. And the devil is behind every single one of them. The devil's behind every single one of them. Our true enemy likes to camouflage himself. He likes to camouflage his agenda. He likes to work through people we know and places we go and problems we face. The devil is the enemy. And Paul says, the evil you're experiencing is a lot deeper than you may realize. He keeps going in verse 13, says, for this reason, take up the full armor of God. He says it again, so that you may be able to resist in this evil day and having prepared everything to take your stand. Did you hear that? He says, and having prepared everything. That means that we need to go into battle completely prepared. 
He says, you got to go into this battle realizing that this is going to happen and you need to be completely prepared. He says, get geared up because the battle is going to happen. You need to take every piece of armor that, that, the, that God allows you to have and you need to put it on and gear up so that you are completely prepared for the battle ahead of you. I mean, just imagine a football player getting ready to go into the game. He says, okay, I'm ready for the game. I've got my cleats on. I've got my padded pants on. I've got my hip pads on. I've got my, my rib guards on. I've got my shoulder pads on. I've got my neck roll on. I'm ready for the game. What happens if he goes into that game and forgets to put on his helmet? Can I tell you what? He gets lit up. He's not going to make it very long. He said, but I've got all these other pads on. I've got all this. I've got 90% of the gear. I'm ready for the game. Let, let me tell you what Paul says. He said, unless you are completely covered, if you are, uh, until you have the full armor of God, you are not prepared for that game. Listen, if you have everything but your helmet, you're not prepared to play in the game. I saw a bunch of football players yesterday. They weren't prepared for the game either. They were wearing a helmet. But anyways, that's another, <laughs> that's a whole nother subject. We'll talk about that another day. But what Paul just said was, you need to make sure you've got the full armor of God. And if you've got the full armor of God on, guess what? He says, you have everything you need to stand your ground. Everything you need. Verse 14 says, stand therefore with truth like a belt around your waist. That word stand, it literally means to maintain your ground without yielding, without fleeing. He said, if you're standing on the truth of God's word, guess what? You can stand there and you can withstand the battle. You can stand there on the truth. Now, if you're standing on a lie that the devil whispered in your ear, guess what? You're not going to make it very long. But he says, if you're standing on the word of God, it doesn't matter what comes up against you. You are completely prepared to stand your ground. Stand, therefore, with truth like a belt around your waist. He goes on to say, and righteousness like armor on your chest. That, that word righteousness is, in the original language is the same word where we get the word Messiah. And so right here, Paul is referencing a combination of two different things. First of all, he's, he's referencing the truth. And he says, we are only righteous because Christ, who is completely righteous, lives within us. But then he also is talking about righteous works, which means when we love people like Christ loves them, we demonstrate the righteousness of God to a world who needs to see that he's righteous. You get that? In verse 15, he goes on to say, and your feet sandaled with readiness for the gospel of peace. You know what that verse is telling us to do? To be ready. He's saying you ought to live your life with a readiness to go into battle every single day. He said, be ready because temptation is coming. Be ready because persecution is coming. Be ready because people are gonna come up against you if you're standing on the word of God. Be ready for it. But it tells you that it's okay and you can have that readiness because the gospel of Jesus Christ is gonna serve as a source of peace in your life. You've got the gospel. You've got the hope of Jesus Christ and it's gonna serve as a source of peace for you. Got it? You ready to keep going? Verse 16, in every situation, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. This version says, which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows. But a more accurate, literal translation of that verse would read like this, which will certainly extinguish all the flaming arrows. You see, it's a given. Right here, Paul is telling us as believers that the devil cannot penetrate, not even with flaming arrows, he cannot penetrate a shield of true faith. The faith shield is more powerful than the devil's flaming arrows. And so right here, Paul's reminding us of how important that really is. Verse 17, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Right here, the Holy Trinity is implied. The helmet of salvation, it's pointing us to Jesus, right? The helmet of salvation. The sword of the spirit is pointing us to the, the Holy Spirit. It's giving us that picture of the Holy Spirit. And it also mentions the word of God. So Paul says, put on your helmet and pick up your sword and then you're ready for battle. I want you to see that the armor of God isn't just one piece. I'll put it this way. The armor of God isn't a onesie, right? Like we have to put on multiple pieces if we're gonna be prepared for the battle. And if we fail to put on just one single piece, what happens? We become vulnerable to the devil's attacks. You can wear the helmet of salvation, 
But let me just say, you can say, I, I, I've been saved, man. I, I remember when I was six years old, VBS. I said a prayer, walked an aisle, got dunked. I am saved. I'm a child of God. I'm wearing my helmet of salvation. Let me just tell you, you're not okay until you pick up the sword as well. He mentions both of them. He mentioned the helmet. He mentions the sword. We've got to pick up every single piece or we become vulnerable to the devil's attack. See, the devil will attack where your armor is weak. Evil's like a cancer. It's coming for you. And it's looking for a place of vulnerability and it attacks the weakest place and it has one goal and that is to destroy the entire body. That's what evil wants to do to this body. That's what evil wants to do to your body. Evil is coming and we've got to be prepared. That's why we've got to put on the full armor of God. Verse 18 is going to teach us how to pray. He says, pray at all times in the spirit with every prayer and request and stay alert with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. Pray also for me that the message may be given to me when I open my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. For this, I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I might be bold enough to speak about it as I should. So how should we pray? Well, Paul's gonna tell us a few things here. If you're taking notes, the first thing I want you to see is that he tells us pray in the spirit. Pray in the spirit. Pray at all times in the spirit, he says. So praying in the spirit, what does that mean? It means that when you pray, your, your spirit ought to align with the spirit of God. If you're praying for something that contradicts what God's will is, he's telling you that, that you're praying for the wrong thing. We ought to pray where our will connects to his will. Our spirit submits to his spirit every single time. He says, pray at all times in the spirit. So the second thing is pray on all occasions. Another way to say that is pray in every season. What does that mean? Pray when times are good and pray when times are bad. Pray when you have everything in the world that you want and pray when you have a need in your life. He's saying no matter what the season looks like, you ought to pray with the same consistency, with the same passion, pray on all occasions. The third thing he tells us that we ought to pray for all believers. The NIV says, keep on praying for all the Lord's people. And I think he tells us that because our tendency is just to pray for our people, right? He says, no, pray for all believers, all the saints, all the Lord's people. We want to pray for us. We want to pray for the Baptist. We don't want to pray for anybody else. Can I just tell you something? The Lord says, that is not the way that it's supposed to happen. You ought to pray for everybody who knows Christ like you do. We're all a part of the same family. That denomination is like a tag. You go to heaven, it flies off. You go to hell, it burns off, right? I mean, at the end of the day, it's just all about who knows the Lord and who doesn't. He said, pray for all believers. He said, you ought to intercede for people that have faith like you have faith. Verse 19, Paul tells us to pray for spiritual leaders as well. Read those words. Pray also for me that the message may be given to me when I open my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. So Paul's saying to the believers, please pray for me. When I open my mouth, I want to speak truth. And I ask you to do the same thing for me. Pray that I could do that very same thing that Paul is talking about. And lastly, he goes on to say that pray for boldness. And that's not just for spiritual leaders. Listen, that's for you. Pray for boldness that we might be able, maybe bold enough to speak about it as we should, like Paul said right here. A lot of us need to pray for boldness because we're afraid. We're scared to bring up Jesus. We're scared to talk about our faith at work or at school. And let me tell you why you're afraid. It's because the devil's been working on your fear for a long time. The devil knows if he can make you fearful, he can cause you to be unfaithful. The devil knows that fear is one of the, the best tools in the world to paralyze believers in their faith and prevent them to, from walking forward in obedience. If the devil wants to stop you in your tracks, all he has to do is make you scared. So when something evil is on our path, I want you to see it's natural to be fearful. But can I tell you something about the devil today? The devil doesn't have creation power. He's not as big and bad as you think he is. He only has corruption power. He's not as, he's not as powerful as God. He's not even close. He, he, he doesn't have creation power. He only has corruption power. You, you see, what is evil exactly? Can I tell you? Evil is the corruption of a created thing. That's what evil is. It's the corruption of a created thing. You think about the story of Adam and Eve. He, he didn't create the apple, he just corrupted it. 
He took something that was normal, something that was natural, something that was beautiful and created by God, and he corrupted it by infusing evil into the apple. And he does the same thing in our lives. He works really hard to make harmful things seem harmless. So I was thinking about evil attacks this week and where they come from. I really narrowed it down to three different sources. And if you're taking notes, jot these down. The first source of evil being infused in your life is just basically sin and temptation. It is sin and temptation in our life. I mean, it goes all the way back to the scripture that calls the devil a schemer. He's a schemer and he's scheming in your life. And let me tell you why he is scheming. He's scheming in such a way to convince you that sin is okay. The devil is working hard in this culture to convince people that sin is okay. As I was thinking about horrible major atrocities in my lifetime, I was thinking about, you know, the bombing of 9-11. We mentioned that last week. I was thinking about the, the Boston Marathon bomb. I was thinking about the Christmas party at San Bernardino. I was thinking about the countless strikes from ISIS throughout the years. And, and I'm thinking about these things and I'm just reminded of something very basic. Evil is real. Evil is real. Even people that I know that deny the existence of God, they all agree that, that evil is real. Nobody ever disagrees with that. And Satan is the author and the instigator of all things evil. I mean, Jesus tells us plainly. He calls the devil the father of all lies. He calls him a thief. He calls him a murderer. He, he, said, he, he said that he's the ruler of this world, and he tells us that he's working through the sons of disobedience to bring evil into this world. But here's what I want you to see about that. Those terrorists, those gunmen, they were delusional, they were paranoid, they were deranged, but the devil didn't make them commit those terrible, heinous crimes against humanity. He didn't make them. But you know what he did do? He influenced them. And somehow he convinced them that committing those crimes was justified. He convinced them of that. And so they moved forward and they did exactly that. They committed horrible crimes against humanity. But here's what I want you to see. In the same way he influenced those people, he influences us to do the same thing. Maybe not bomb something, but he tempts us and he uses different things to negatively impact our spiritual and mental condition to some degree. He may use uh, an addiction to drugs or alcohol. He may use something like damaging emotions such as bitterness or envy or greed or hate or prejudice or exhaustion to modify our decision making. I mean, I was thinking back to the story of Herod at the time of Jesus' birth. And I'm just reminded that the devil used self-intoxication to convince him that, that he needed to order the murder of all little boys two years or under in the town of Bethlehem. Was that satanic? Yeah. Was that demonic? Absolutely. But it's that same kind of demonic influences that try to in, influence us and convince us that looking at pornography isn't going to hurt anybody. It's that same kind of demonic influence and it's that same whisper in our ear that tries to tell us that getting drunk isn't that bad of a deal or having a sexual relationship out of marriage isn't that big of a deal or, or stealing money that doesn't belong to you shouldn't be a big deal because you've worked hard and you deserve more than you already get. It's like we start listening to this voice in our head that doesn't come from the Lord and he tempts us and convinces us that sin is okay. Let me tell you, it's dangerous. And Satan is one who's tempting us to sin, and he does so by corrupting created things and convincing us that his way is better than God's way. I mean, think about this. He corrupted an apple and convinced Adam and Eve that if they just took a bite of the apple, they'd be like God. I mean, how crafty is that? But now today, you don't see him corrupting fruit. You see him corrupting things like smartphones and computers and television and bad friendships, and sinful relationships, and work environments, and school friends. And it's like these good, normal things that aren't that big of a deal, but now all of a sudden, Satan is infusing his evil into it. And he's starting to shape the culture in a way that is demonic. And you know what's bad about that? Listen, the Bible says if we give in to that, and we follow that path, and we turn our back to God, and we start believing the lies of the evil one, yes, you're going to fall. Yes, you're going to fail. But the Bible also tells us that it ends with destruction. We're going to be destroyed. James chapter 1 verse 13 says, No one undergoing a trial should say, I am being tempted by God. 
since God is not tempted by evil and he himself doesn't tempt anyone, but each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desire. Check this out. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. It's destruction. Sin leads to death every single time. So the sources of evil, how the, how the devil likes to infuse evil into our life. Number one, sin and temptation. Can I give you number two? Self. Self is number two. Remember last week we talked about this. Jesus said, first and foremost, deny your self, right? Deny yourself. It's because in our life, we have a couple of different options. We can lean to self or we can lean to the Savior, right? It's like you can't lean to both self and Savior. And maybe it's just me, but it seems like Christians have started to adopt this, this policy of peaceful coexistence with sin and the devil, I mean, right now I'm scrolling through Facebook. It looks like people are starting to hold hands with the devil. I see Christians like holding hands with the devil and skipping through meadows and stuff. It's getting weird. It's like now all of a sudden we live in a culture where we think I can, I can live with Jesus and do Jesus things on Sunday, but I can still do this stuff with the world and be cool and, and hip and a part of a crowd and accepted. I can do both. Listen, the Bible says that's never gonna work. The Bible says when you try to combine self and sin and also holiness, it's going to be bad every single time. Those things cannot coexist. And so if you're holding hands with the devil and skipping through the meadow, let me just give you a warning. It ain't going to work. I saw something this week that drives me crazy. And now it seems like everybody's got these t-shirts on and they're, they got these bumper stickers on their car and they got little coffee cups and they're so cute and adorable, but they say, I love Jesus, but dot, dot, dot. Let me just say, I love Jesus, but it, it should stop. At, I love Jesus. I, read, I saw a shirt yesterday, somebody was wearing this shirt. Somebody that I know and respect, they said, I love Jesus, but I also love to party. I love Jesus, there's another one, I love Jesus, but I also drink a lot. I, also, I love Jesus, but I cuss. And we're like, oh, that's so, you're so cool. No, you're not, you're crazy. Listen, that's not the way that God designed it. Every time you try to com combine self and holiness, let me just tell you, it's not gonna work, they can't coexist. We all have a desire to say, I love Jesus, but, right? We would all love to play both sides of the table, but Jesus said, you're gonna have to deny yourself. He said, you're gonna have to repent from your sin, not hold hands with your sin. The sin's what put Jesus on the cross. How can you say you love Jesus if you're holding hands with the thing that murdered Jesus? And so what he's saying is you turn your back to that, you walk to Jesus. You can't walk to sin and walk to Jesus. You have to choose. It's either him or the world. So let's just get real clear here. Self should be your enemy. Self should be one of your greatest enemies because as soon as you start leaning to self, you're turning your back on Jesus. But when you turn to Jesus, you turn your back to yourself. We get it? Say amen. All right, let's go to number three getting carried away here. Y'all are starting to get me where I'm wanting to preach a little bit. The third one is sleeping. The devil loves to use sleeping. I'm not talking about physically sleeping. I'm talking about spiritually sleeping. Let me tell you what I mean by that. The devil loves it when we as children of God choose to close our eyes to the evil that's around us. Here's what the devil wants you to do. The devil wants you to just give up and to close your eyes and say, what's the point? It's evil around me. Hey, the devil's all over the place. We're losing this battle. And he wants you to close your eyes rather than being awakened to the fact that we have a responsibility as believers to be light in the darkness. That's what the devil wants you to do. He wants you to close your eyes. God says, open your eyes. Live your lives in a way that you're going to make a difference in the darkness. You need to penetrate the darkness. You need to be light in the, in the environment that you find yourself in. You know what that means? It means that you're gonna get persecuted. Of course, he told you you would. You're gonna be weird, guess what? Jesus told you that you would have to be weird if you're gonna follow him. You're gonna be rejected by some, of course. Listen, none of this should be surprising to you because the Bible warned us. And it said that over and over again. But however, Jesus said, your job is to be light in the darkness. That's your job. Read it, Ephesians 5, 8, Paul's talking. You were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth, 
testing what is pleasing to the Lord. Check this out. Don't participate in the fruitless works of darkness. Don't participate. It's not, I love Jesus, but. It's, I love Jesus, period. Don't participate in the fruitless works of darkness, but instead expose them. Expose them. I love verse 14. He says, get up, sleeper, right? He's talking to the church. And he's saying, church, open your eyes. Wake up. Wake up, you sleeper. Rise up from the dead and Christ will shine on you. I love that because the church was asleep in Ephesus. And I believe most churches in America are asleep today. And here's the word from the Lord today. Church, if you're sleeping to the evil around you, wake up. Wake up. Open your eyes to the fact that the devil is at work and make the decision to put on the full armor of God so you're ready for the battle. He said, pray and keep on praying. Don't be seduced by sinful thoughts and realize that Jesus is the only thing that can overcome the evil in this world. That's the message for today. The message is if God is gonna do great things again, if he's gonna move in our lives, if he's gonna move in our kids' lives, our family, our marriage, our community, our church, if he's gonna move in America, then guess what? We've got to be prepared for the battle. We gotta get ready. And let me just tell you, God is the only solution He's the only one capable. Jesus is the only one capable of doing justice in this battle. So we've got to cling to him. You got to cling to Jesus. Don't just hold hands and skip through the meadow. Listen, turn your back on everything and chase him with everything you've got. I love how one person said it. They said, the closer we are to the shepherd, the safer we are from the wolves. And that's my prayer for us today, that we would stay close to the shepherd, that we'd be prepared for the battle, and that we would move forward in faith every single day.